Hello and welcome to season four, episode seven of Conservation Conversations with Red Lights Back. I'm your host, Christina Hagen, coming to you live from Cape Town. We have 130 episodes recorded and available on YouTube, so if you miss out because of load shedding or your Tuesday nights have become busy, you can always catch up later. So tonight we are talking all about African penguins in honor of World Penguin Day next week, Tuesday. I have the privilege this evening of not only being the host, but also co-presenting uh, to you along with my colleague, Eleanor, Eleanor Vedeman. Uh, Eleanor joined BirdLife South Africa in February this year as the Coastal Seabird Project Manager. And she is responsible for managing some of our seabird tracking research on African penguins, as well as Cape Gannets and Cape Cormorants all of which is aiming to inform an ecosystem approach to fisheries management, as well as uh, she's also responsible for the African Penguin Monitoring System, which she will be telling you about tonight. Uh, she came to BirdLife after spending a year on Marion Island, where she did her MSc looking at the effects of invasive mice and climate change on albatrosses, petrels, and several species of avian scavengers. Uh, she's been a joy to work with so far, and I'm very pleased to have her on the team and presenting with me this evening. Uh, so it's a bit weird to introduce myself, um, but I think many of you may know me from co-hosting these webinars and having a presented on a few of them myself. Um, my position is the Pamela Isdell Fellow of Penguin Conservation, and my work focuses on establishing a new African penguin colony at the Group Nature. And so I will start us off, to, off tonight with a bit of an introduction, and then Eleanor will share some details about her project, and I'll then take the mic again to share some of the latest news at Tuhu. So I'll just swap over presentations, um, and uh, then we can get going. Let me just start sharing again. There we go. Eleanor, can you just quickly confirm that you can see the title slide? Yeah, I can see it, it's all clear. Great, thanks. Okay, so we are talking about African penguins this evening and specifically what BirdLife South Africa is doing to conserve them by ensuring that they have enough access to food. And uh, our work is primarily funded by the Isdell Family Foundation uh, through Pamela Isdell and the Shalf and Emergent Trust. And we're very grateful to both of these uh, um, groups for supporting our work. So just a little bit of background to the African penguin. As the name suggests, it's uh, the only species of penguin to be found in Africa and specifically South Africa and Namibia. Penguins breed on coastal islands uh, along the coast. I think there are about 27 where they have been, um, where they have been recorded breeding. Um, unfortunately, we have had some extinctions um, in the recent past. Lambert's Bay, for example, um, went extinct in, in the mid 2000s. But we, we are focusing, uh, we as penguin conservationists are focusing on the main colonies that are found in South Africa, and those are the seven that are circled um, on, on the screen here. And um, yeah, so we, we focus on those uh, colonies as they are currently the largest. I'm sure many of you have seen a similar slide before. Um, this is just showing the dramatic and very concerning decrease in penguin numbers over the, over the years. They've decreased by over 7% in the last 30 years, which has uh, triggered the, their status on the IUCN Red List of Endangered. And in 2021, the, the last census that they did of the African penguin population, uh, the penguin population was at its lowest that's ever been recorded at fewer than 10,000 pairs in the South Africa. And so this is obviously very concerning and something that we and uh, several other organizations are working very hard to try and uh, change and 
uh, prevent this decline from going on. So some of the threats that penguins are facing, um, these two are historical threats, egg collecting and guano harvesting, um, but they still carry a legacy today. Egg collecting was very prolific in, um, I guess, the, the early parts of the 1900s all the way up until the 1960s. And it's estimated that over half of all the eggs laid uh, on Dassin Island were removed for human consumption. And then guano harvesting uh, was also uh, a major problem for, for penguins and others and all our other coastal seabirds. And this uh, was harvested for use as fertilizer. Um, it was known as white gold. And there were even um, battles fought over control of the guano producing islands. Luckily, both those threats have been stopped. Um, and, but the legacy of guano harvesting, unfortunately, uh, persists to this day through suboptimal breeding habitat. So the penguins used to burrow into this thick layer of guano, and it was a, a, a great place for them to have their nests because it's very thermally stable and the eggs and chicks were protected from aerial predators such as kelp gulls. Uh, so on many of the islands, that thick guano layer was removed and um, the penguins were forced to nest out on the open, but there has been a concerted effort to put in place um, artificial nests and there have been various designs through the years and they've, um, there's been a project that has developed a, um, a, a design that mimics the conditions of a guano burrow. So we are uh, hopefully tackling that threat. Then of course, there's the ever-present threat of oil spills. Um, I'm sure most South Africans would be aware of the, the big oil spills that we've had along our coastline. Luckily, there hasn't been a, a big one in, in recent years. The last one was in 2000, the treasure oil spill, which oiled or affected huge numbers of African penguins. Um, but we also have some great rehabilitation facilities that have been set up well-versed in, in cleaning uh, penguins and, and rehabilitating them. Onto a, a kind of more natural threat, which is, is seal predation. This can be a big prob problem at certain colonies. It's a, a learned behavior where the seals will target penguins returning from their foraging trips and uh, unfortunately go for the, the bellies full of fish and can have a, a big impact on, on the penguin population. Now, the threat that we will be focusing on this evening is the lack of food avail fish availability. Um, and that is, in our view, the most pressing threat facing African penguins as it affects every aspect of their life from adult survival to breeding to, uh, well, all, all, all um, life stage survival, um, as well as how they are able to survive the molting period. So penguins are uh, fish specialists, specifically sardine and anchovy specialists, and that forms the bulk of their diet. And you can see that the, the fish abundance, uh, so this is combined, the, the black bars are sardine and the gray are anchovy. And uh, the abundance of these fish has changed quite a lot over the last 20 odd years, um, but overall a decreasing trend. Um, and this is mirrored quite dramatically in the penguin numbers. And you can just see that line that's appeared that shows that the penguin's uh, population mirrors very closely the fish abundance, which shows just how important it is for them to have good food availability. So now I'm going to hand over to Eleanor to um, take us through the next bit about the fish distribution and uh, then on to her work on England monitoring. Take it away, Eleanor. Thanks, Christina. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'll jump right in. Um, so because penguins are fish specialists, um, not only are we concerned with trends in the amount of fish, but also 
where the fish are found along the coast of South Africa. Um, is it changing? There we go. So in the 1980s, um, the fish were predominantly located along the west coast of South Africa. And you can see um, in the red and orange colors there, that's the core distribution of anchovy in the 1980s. Um, and sardines follow a very similar pattern. And because of this concentration along the west coast, the fishery also started along the west coast and really concentrated their fishing efforts along that coastline. Um, they also established uh, all their port landings and canneries, major um, the majority of them along the west coast. However, fast forward to 2010, you can see the 1980s distribution has gone to the gray colors and the, 20, the, the distribution of fish in the 2000s is now in the rainbow colors. And the fish have completely shifted from the west coast along to the south and east coasts. Um, we're not 100% sure why this happened. Um, there definitely seems to be links to changes in sea surface temperature. Um, and it could also be due to fishing pressure on the west coast. Um, and one of the repercussions of the shift in the fish distributions is that fisheries have not been able to follow this shift. And this is because uh, moving the permanent structures such as your landing ports and canneries is very difficult. Um, and what we've seen is a concurrent decrease in seabird densities on the west coast, not only of African penguins, but also of Cape Gannets and Cape Cormorants, which also fish specialists. Um, and it's really this link between African penguins and their food source that BirdLife South Africa is focusing on in terms of our conservation strategy for African penguins. And we, re we are trying um, to ensure that African penguins have the best opportunities possible to find as much fish as they need. And we have a two pronged approach. Um, we focus on ensuring enough food around existing colonies. And that's a lot of the work that I focus on and we'll be talking about today. And then we're also doing work on establishing new colonies, which is what Christina will talk about. Um, so I'm now to focus on ensuring food around existing colonies. Um, it's a very <laughs> tricky question of how do you ensure that there's enough food um, for the penguins during their breeding um, season. But how do you even know how much fish there is? Um, the ocean is huge and it's highly dynamic. So this can be a very tricky question to answer. Um, the Department of Forestry, Fisheries and the Environment have been conducting annual surveys for anchovy and sardine around our entire coastline since 1984. And they follow the set transects that you can see along the whole coast. Um, and this gives us an idea of how much fish there is. And this is done during the spawning and then also the recruitment stages of the fish. Um, but to, um, to do surveys twice a year rarely provides just a snapshot. Um, as I said, the ocean is incredibly, incredibly dynamic and things change on you know, the scale of days and weeks rather than uh, over years. Um, and so what scientists have really been trying to do is to try to figure out ways of how can we monitor changes in ecosystems and in ecosystem health at scales that are much more conducive to conservation. One thing that scientists have been um, doing is using seabirds as indicators of ecosystem health. Um, there have been a number of papers published on this over the last few decades, um, with several big reviews coming out recently. Um, and the idea is that seabirds cover large sections of the ocean. Um, they can locate prey very efficiently, much more efficiently than a ship going once or twice a year and just doing random transects. The seabirds actually target prey um, prey uh, schools of fish and prey. Um, seabirds will often feed on commercially important fish. And these, will, these are obviously the fish that are then also targeted by fisheries. Um, and then seabirds also breed on land. So they're easily accessible for scientists to collect data from them. 
And this is just a uh, some tracks to illustrate how much area penguins can travel or cover on, on a scale of days. These are tracks from African penguins at Stony Point. And you can see that they leave their breeding colony, travel over vast areas of ocean and are essentially sampling all of that ocean for us. And we can really tap into this and use seabirds as indicators. Um, and so penguins in particular have been used for this um, in several different projects. And the way that this has been done in the past and what BirdLife is doing is to install automated penguin monitoring systems or APMSs. Which, and what this consists of is a weigh bridge. So it weighs the penguin when it's uh, the colony and when it comes back. And so we can track how the penguin's mass changes over time. And that is obviously related to how much fish that is available. And many of these systems will have a tag reader. So just like the tags that you put in your cats and dogs in case they get lost, penguins also often have these tags inserted under the skin. And so we can see how individual penguins change their foraging activities and how their mass changes over time. And so together, this wave bridge and tag reader that gives us real-time data, so sampling on a scale of days or weeks rather than just once or twice a year. Um, and these time scales are much more um, conducive to effective conservation and effective management. There have been several examples of how APMSs have been used in the past of several different species of penguins. The first one was the daily penguins in Antarctica in the early 1990s. Um, it's been used for little penguins in Australia and recently for macaroni penguins in South Georgia. Um, and BirdLife South Africa has been installing these APMSs um, at African penguin colonies. And we're really trying to use this APMS idea as a tool to ensure African penguin conservation. We have installed two systems already. So one at Bird Island in the Eastern Cape and one at Stony Point in the Western Cape. And later this year, we will also be installing on Dyer Island. And in the pipeline, we are hoping to also install on the West Coast, so at Dusson and Robin Island. Um, our system looks like this. This is the system at Bird Island. It consists of two scales that you can see in the middle picture and a tag reader. Um, and we have the two scales, they're exactly the same. The only thing that they tell us is the direction that the penguins are moving. So whether the penguin is leaving the colony to go and fish or whether the penguin is arriving back from um, foraging. And this data is sent to the cloud via this Wi-Fi router. Um, and so we can get real-time data of penguin foraging um, every day and this project is yeah it's a large project several stages and steps to it the first stage was designing building and installing and this has been um, driven a lot by Pierre Tiff who's an electrical engineer um, he designed and built the current system that we have installed now at um, Stony and Bird Island and we know what our final goal is to have a fully calibrated working system that gives us information on how much fish penguins are catching. But in the middle, there's a lot of um, dark magic, as one of our colleagues calls it, and statistics that needs to happen. And this is really where we need to put our thinking caps on um, and try to calibrate the system. And there are various ways that we need to calibrate the system before we can get out reliable data. Um, the first is to calibrate according to the movements of penguins over the scales. So in an ideal world, you know, a penguin would come out of the ocean after fishing, he'll stand on the scale for a few seconds, we'll get a perfect mass, and then he'll go off and feed his chicks. But as we know, um, the reality is not always <laughs> um, as easygoing as the ideal world. And so what we have to do is to calibrate it to the penguin movements. So in this video, I'll play it just now, you can see we have the APMS with the two permanent scales. And we then put up a temporary calibration scale. So a third scale that we only put up for a short period. Of time. And this scale has a screen um, that we can view um, with a video camera. 
I'm just going to play this video. You can see a penguin approaching the permanent scales. It stands on the two scales and then hops onto the calibration scale. Um, and you can just see in the red circle how much that mass changes because the penguin isn't standing still. Um, you also get several different scenarios. You can have you know, three or four penguins at the same time. You can have a penguin that stands on the scale and then falls off. Um, you can have a dusty run over the scale at the same time a penguin is standing on it. So there's various um, scenarios and Pierre Tiff has been working on an algorithm to uh, extract the most reliable data we can using these calibration videos. Um, we can then also or we need to do a ecological calibration. So the first step is to do fish surveys. So we want to know how much fish is around each of the breeding colonies. Um, and we do this um, through fish surveys. We want to do it using an autonomous vehicle um, that is constantly surveying for fish. And we can then see what outputs we're getting from the APMS and relate that to how much fish is available. Um, this is ongoing. We are hoping to do some test uh, surveys this year, hopefully, and then start doing um, full surveys next year. Um, yeah, but there's still a lot of thinking and work needs to go into this. The other part of the ecological calibration is to look at penguin energy metrics. So if there is X amount of fish uh, around a breeding colony, we need to figure out how well can penguins find that fish? How much energy does it take for them to find and catch the fish? And then how much energy are they take or receiving from how much fish they catch? And your cameras that we tape to the penguin. So you can see from this penguin, there's a massive school of fish and loads of other penguins um, catching fish. There's another school up at the surface there. <laughs> um, I love these videos. <laughs> um, and from these videos, we can determine how much the penguins are catching on a typical foraging trip um, and then relate that to the mass gain or loss that the APMS shows for a given day. Um, and so once we have this calibrated system, um, still a lot of work needs to go into it. Um, we will have several applications of this um, system that will hopefully contribute significantly towards African penguin conservation. The first is, of course, management. So management can use this tool to make decisions that is based on near real-time data and very large representative sample sizes. So rather than just you know, trying to figure out how much food is available based on a fish survey that's done once or twice a year, we can now use this APMS that is sampling on a scale of days and weeks. We can also use the APMS as a monitoring tool. So we can monitor um, the effects of various conservation measures, including fishing closures around penguin colonies. And this will be particularly important when stocks are low. And it can also be used as an education and awareness tool. We are working towards um, having this data available online on a website, which can then be used for talks. It can be used at schools and to raise awareness of the plight of the African penguin. So yeah, that's the APMS. And I'll hand over now to Christina um, to talk about how she is working to establish new African penguin colonies. Great, thanks very much, Eleanor. Um, yeah, so I I hope m most of you um, haven't seen my previous talks because I will be um, sharing a lot of the, the same information, but um, I thought I would just give a bit of a recap uh, for those of you who, who have, perhaps haven't seen uh, previous Conservation Conversations webinars that I've given. Uh, so yeah, I'm, working on trying to establish a or re-establish a, a penguin colony at the Dupont Nature Reserve. And you can see on the, the map there that um, the Dupont Nature Reserve is about 250 k's uh, to the east of Cape Town. And it's right in that area where um, the, the fish, fish have kind of shifted their distribution to. So there is a good abundance of fish in that area. 
but unfortunately there aren't any breeding any islands where the penguins can breed. They generally need to breed on islands because they are naturally free of terrestrial predators, such as leopards and caracal and gannet, um, that really cause trouble for them when they breed on the next island. Stony Point and at Betty's Bay and Boulder's uh, colony at Simonstown, they are able to survive because of human habitation around the, those colonies, which reduces the uh, abundance of predators in those areas. So we identified the De Hoop Nature Reserve as a spot where we would like to try and establish a colony because uh, this the small uh, headland that you can see here uh, was actually the site of a penguin, a, sh a short-lived penguin colony in the kind of early 2000s, but unfortunately predation, predation by caracal caused the penguins to abandon the colony. And so that obviously made it very important for us to uh, prevent this from happening again. And so to that end, in 2018, we put in a predator-proof fence, which you can see running along this, this, um, in this picture here. And so it's, it's um, an area of about two hectares that we fenced off. The fence is about 300 uh, meters long, about 2.4 meters high to prevent any, and um, is electrified to prevent uh, animals such as leopards and caracal from getting in. And it has been quite successful uh, to date. And um, yeah, it's been, been great to, to a big learning curve for me on, on how to manage an electric fence and do all sorts of maintenance. Um, but it's been, been a, a good success. So then we had to set about the task of attracting penguins to come to the site. And first we used a technique called social attraction. And that kind of relies on the fact that penguins like most seabirds are colonial. They like to breed in colonies. Uh, it's their safety in numbers. So we wanted to make it look and sound like there was already a penguin colony there. So we had the amazing penguin decoys made by an artist called Wolf Darling, and we have them scattered all around the colony site, uh, waiting for their uh, flesh and blood um, counterparts. And then the other part of this sort of trickery was playing penguin calls. So we set up this, this massive speaker uh, to play penguin calls pretty much 24 uh, seven to make it sound like there was already a penguin colony there. And I should uh, mention that this work is being done in collaboration with Cape Nature and also with Sankov. So in 2021, we moved on to the next phase of the project, uh, which was to actually release penguins at the site. So every year, some eggs and chicks are abandoned by their parents at other colonies. These get rescued and sent to Sankob where they are hand reared and, until they're ready for release. And generally they get released at existing colonies, but we take a subset of them. And we're aiming for 60 penguins per year to be released at the group. And uh, we have started keeping them. You can see here, there's a pen. We keep them in a pen overnight at the colony and we give them some food and uh, rehydrate them after the, the drive from Cape Town, which is about four hours, and then keep them overnight at the colony to try and get them to imprint on the colony site. And then the next morning, they we open up the pen and they head out to sea. And I find a lot of people are quite surprised about that because you know, we would, you would uh, expect us to want the penguins to stay, but these are young birds at an age when they would fledge and go to sea naturally from, from a while if they had, you know, been reared by, by wild parents. And it's just part of their life history. They, when they're old enough, they leave the colony, they go to sea and spend the next uh, three to six years um, at sea, they come to land to molt, 
um, but most of the time they're at sea and we think they're kind of prospecting, looking around different areas to decide where they are going to breed. And so we hope by releasing them at the hook, they will decide to come back and breed there. So this is a uh, phase, yes, uh, just a video of our last group of penguins. And um, this was in February this year, actually. Um, our last group that we released uh, heading out to sea. Uh, we have so far released 182 juvenile penguins from the hook over two years. And um, I always just love this moment where they find me, it, it kind of takes them a little while to, to realize that they're free to go and what they need to do, but their instinct kicks in and they all uh, head out to sea usually in a group. Um, for this release, this, this little guy uh, didn't quite get the memo and took a little, a few mo moments to, to figure out what to do before it too headed out. Um, and I cut the video there, but it did go and join, join the rest of its, its friends um, going out to sea. So it's always such a rewarding moment to see these birds going out uh, into the ocean and just kind of knowing instinctively what they need to do. So we also have put some trackers on some of the birds that we've released just to see where they go immediately after a release. Um, and this map shows, so the different colors show different uh, birds. We've tracked about uh, six individuals so far. Um, and here's, here's the group. And you can see that they usually head up, up the west coast. This um, sort of light blue bird went all the way to the border with Namibia. And this seems also to be an instinctive uh, pattern of movement that's been demonstrated by another study by Richard Shirley, who, who showed that it seems to be kind of hardwired into juvenile penguins to, to head up the West Coast. Um, this is unfortunate because un unfortunately there's, there's not much fish up, um, up in Namibia and along the West Coast. Uh, so hopefully the, you see this green bird and the white bird kind of get hung around on the South Coast. Uh, so hopefully they, they have done well um, to, to stay there and found a good amount of food. So that was kind of the two phases of the project that we uh, have implemented. And I had been expecting, I'd resigned myself to, to waiting, you know, another three to six years for the first of these young penguins that we'd really uh, to come back to the colony. But in June last year, we made the the surprising and very welcome discovery that there were some adult penguins hanging around the colony sites. So these were birds that we hadn't released. Uh, they hadn't, um, it, was, it would have been too soon for any of the birds that we released the previous year to come back and be in, in adult plumage and ready to breed. So it was a, an amazing day when we found our first adult penguins. So these were uh, the first two that we found there. Um, and these are just some more shots of, of birds uh, at the colony. So you can see uh, the decoys were quite a hit. Uh, I often see uh, penguins sitting next to the decoys, which is uh, quite nice. And strangely enough, they also uh, seem to really like sitting next to the speaker, which is very, very loud. Um, but I guess they, they uh, like the... <laughs> the the safety the, the illusion of well not the illusion but the the safety that it provides or the the stimulus that it provides of having other penguins uh, nearby and we've had quite a quite a few penguins uh, coming to the the site to molt as well which is very a very encouraging sign and and quite a few juvenile birds molting into adult plumage so these these ones in the sort of uh, brownish gray plumage are um, probably about one years one year old and they're molting for the first time into their their black and white adult plumage. So it's very encouraging that these birds uh, have chosen to molt there. And um, I once we we found the adults, I'd been hoping to you know hoping that we would get some breeding, but I hadn't seen any 
any evidence of that until uh, until October uh, last year when I saw this uh, little fat chick and its brother uh, sitting at the colony, um, at, actually at a nest kind of just below the speaker, which was also quite interesting. Uh, so that was also a fantastic day and quite unexpected to find them, having kind of resigned myself again to a bit more waiting, uh, that we found that, you know, there was one pair breeding managed to successfully raise two chicks. Um, so here's just some more photos of the chick. Um, you can see here begging from the parent that's just come back from sea. And this is a, a video that I took of the, and you can see the two chicks following the parent. Apologies for the shakiness of the video. It was extremely windy the day that I was there and even on a tripod. Uh, the, the wind was shaking the, the camera. And so this was just such a joy to see these two little chicks um, having been successfully raised by their parents. So these are the first chicks to, to have been hatched at the hoop in 15 years. Um, so that was extremely gratifying to see that our hard work uh, had paid off. Um, so the chicks uh, fledged successfully by about late November, which was also good to see. And uh, after that, I had um, move on from this. Um, there were just some other birds hanging around, finishing up molting. Uh, so that was great to see. So one of the things that I tried to do uh, whenever I, well, I continue to try and do whenever I see penguins at the colony is to take a photo of the front of the bird because each penguin has a unique spot pattern. And so on the left here, you can see a photo from June, which was the, the very first two, the two penguins that we saw there. And then on the right, you can see a photo from August. And these two are the same individuals. Um, you can see from the spot patterns uh, of A and A on this side are the same and B and B. And I'll just show you a kind of zoomed in photo of um, the B bird. You can see the pattern of spots is the same. And so that was very exciting that I, that I had the, the same birds hanging around um, the, the colony consistently. And so I have now managed to build up a sort of library of, of uh, penguin photos, not all of them. I haven't seen all of them uh, repeatedly, but um, I'm starting to, to try and build up this library. So I'll be able to identify individuals if they return again to breed. So I'd like you to focus in on this bird, AP005. Um, it's got this sort of distinctive C shape to its spot. Uh, so this is the kind of zoomed out photo that was taken in November last year by Kevin Shaw, who visited the colony with me to, to help get some better photos. So you can see here this kind of sort of C shape on the front of the penguin. And then this is sort of hot off the press news. I was there on uh, Thursday last week so there had been kind of a patch uh, from late December until quite recently where there were no penguins at the colony uh, whatsoever. And then I have started seeing one or two showing up. And when I was there on Thursday, I saw a familiar shape on this uh, penguin that had just come ashore uh, from a foraging trip. And you can see here the same C shape. So it's AP005 come back to the to her colony again, which was very exciting for me to see and a, a nice penguin to, to be able to recognize. Um, so I was also very, very excited about that. And yeah, I can't wait to see what, what happens this season. So I've just to kind of show 
uh, sort of how difficult it can be to spot the penguins when they're there. This is a, a trail camera that I've set up to take photos every 30 minutes. And I've just kind of stitched them together in the circle, you'll see uh, penguins and you can just see how over the course of the day, the numbers of birds change. So if you're there at, if I had come here at, at two o'clock, I wouldn't have seen any birds, whereas if I'd come later, there would have been more. So this kind of just shows the, the difficulty of, of being able to monitor uh, the penguins at this colony because it's very rocky. There's all sorts of crevices that they can be hiding in. Um, and I have quite a few photos like this to, to go through to try and spot the penguin in amongst all these rocks. And uh, don't be fooled, there are some decoys in there as well. So that um, adds a little bit of uh, extra uh, difficulty to the, to the task. So, uh, sorry, let me move on. What's next for this project? So also something very exciting that I saw on Thursday when I was there were these two penguins sort of cozying up together under a rock that looks like it could be quite a good nest site. Um, so I suspect these, these penguins have paired up Hopefully they will be starting to breed soon. So I will uh, keep my eyes peeled if I can to to see if they have any any chicks or eggs in the in the next few weeks. And to to help me with that, I'm uh, going to be in, oops, sorry going to be installing uh, another CCTV camera. I have some cameras that monitor the fence line, but I don't have any that are pointing at the uh, where the penguins are. So I'm going to be installing one of these um, for the PPZ camera pan tilt and zoom that I'm able to control remotely and be able to kind of keep an eye on what's happening around where the penguins are sitting. And then I will also be installing um, a transponder reader. So similar to, to what Eleanor uh, showed you earlier in the presentation, but just without the scales. So it will be able to pick up any of the penguins that are there to have the, the small microchips that enable us to identify. Them. So I'm very excited about those two monitoring tools that will be going in hopefully in the next month or so. And so with that, um, it just remains for me to thank our donors, particularly uh, Pamela Isdell through the Isdell Family Foundation and the Charles Family Trust, uh, and, and then also Mass March uh, provided a lot of the funding for the APMS project that Eleanor spoke about. So yeah, thank you very much to, to all of these sponsors and partners, uh, Cape Nature and Sankob, specifically for the Hope project, and um, have been great, uh, great partners in in that work as well. But yeah, we'd like to thank all of our, our partners and sponsors. So with that, we can end off and we can start to look and see if there are any questions. Uh, Eleanor, you uh, you can switch on your video again and uh, join me to answer some questions. And Alistair, if you're there and you also want to join in and, and say hello, you're welcome to. Um, Alistair McInnes is the uh, program manager of the Seabird Conservation Program and uh, has joined us to see, uh, joined us for the question uh, session. So we only have, we have two questions so far. So yeah, please remember you can put them in the Q&A box or in the, or in the chat feed, but preferably the Q&A box as it's easier for us to see them. Um, and also on the Facebook uh, comment feed. So uh, the first um, question, sorry, let me find it there. Okay, from Henny. Thank you very much for your, your, your kind words. Um, is there any impact of the predator fence on the environment? That is a, a great question. So we, we did uh, quite a lot of work before we put in the fence to uh, see, to, to answer that question um, exactly, because we didn't, we are working in a nature reserve, we didn't want to have any impact on 
um, you know, on the on the nature reserve itself. So it's quite a small area. So we're not affecting the predators um, control uh, well, pre the predators um, access to any prey or their their territory, and um, there are also no sort of endangered or threatened plant species that we could be affecting. Um, so it is a very low impact fence. Um, then the next one I will ask is uh, from Alistair Stalker um, asking about evidence of penguins being affected by avian flu. Um, Eleanor, I don't know if you want to try and answer that or Alistair, otherwise I can give it a go if you... Um, um, yeah, it's a great question and <laughs> something we keep asking ourselves every time we go and work in these colonies. Um, they definitely are affected by avian flu. Um, as far as I know, last year we didn't have many penguins affected um, and it remains to be seen this year. Um, we do take all precautions when moving between colonies. Um, and I know Sam Cobb has in the past gone into a complete quarantine to ensure that no avian flu gets out into the wild population. Um, so yeah, it is definitely something that we are looking at this year and every year that we start our breeding deployments and every time we go to the colonies. So yeah, definitely something that we need to be aware of. Yeah, um, there have been um, some outbreaks of avian flu in the last few years that have affected other seabirds, um, notably swift terns or greater crested terns and um, Cape cormorants. But so far we haven't luckily had a huge number of uh, African penguins affected. There have been small numbers, which, and, you know, small, small numbers is still not great, but um, they haven't been too badly affected. Um, then, then Ruthie asks uh, whether a drone would help with spotting penguins in the rocks. Yes, that is something that I have uh, considered. Um, it's just a bit tricky with all the, uh, the drone pilot licensing and making sure that I don't um, inadvertently disturb the penguins or other species that are there. So Cape cormorants, white-breasted cormorants, and greater-breasted tern, terns also roost at the site, and uh, kelp gulls as well. And, and kelp gulls have been known to attack drone species. So um, it is something I plan to do a bit more research into, because there are parts of the that headland that I can't actually see very easily. So a drone would help uh, immensely, I think. Um, then the next question, ah, Alistair, there you are. Um, I think I'm gonna throw this one to you. Um, <laughs> uh, from, from Michael Cherry, to what extent can the decline in penguin numbers be attributed to overfishing as opposed to the shift in pelagic fish distribution? Thanks, Christina, and thanks, Michael, for that yeah, very important question. And it's something we, um, grapple with um, many times because these fish are obviously both affected by natural processes and man-made processes. So the one uh, mechanism to try and answer that question around breeding colonies has been an island closure experiment, which has um, happened between 2008 and 2020. And that was in paired islands around, or two on the West Coast, two in Algoa Bay, so Dasson and Robin on the West, Bird Island and St. Croix Island in Algoa Bay. And those were open and closed to three years alternating closures to try to tease out natural versus um, overfishing impacts on those colonies. So those results are currently being reviewed by an international panel as we speak. So the results of that, that review will be out in June. Um, but there's been lots of papers uh, that have been published in the scientific literature that show the impacts of fishing and cumulative catches around colonies. So we do know these that um, fishing is an, an issue, 
but when it happens um, is something that we need to look into more detail and i.e as Eleanor mentioned earlier when fish stocks are really low we know that competition is going to have a bigger impact than when fish stocks are relatively high and there's fish available to both fishermen and penguins so very interesting question and yeah difficult one to tease apart um, there was also a question about bird island christina yes um, yeah i was going to say that link in also a question from charlotte um asking about the fish enclosure around bird island yes yeah, so yeah there has been um alternating closures and there is currently an interim closure around bird island at the moment until the uh, panel review has been concluded and recommendations are made to the minister but that um Island, the, the waters around Bird Island are have haven't had any fishing historically compared to St. Croix, which is 50 odd kilometers as the crow flies from that and will go basis. So St. Croix gets a lot more fishing than Bird Island. So Bird Island's more of a sort of natural control, I suppose, for St. Croix Island in a way. It doesn't get much fishing there around that island, even though it has been closed. Yeah, great. Thanks for that, Alistair. Um, so I'm going to take three sort of related questions from Sean. Uh, where's the next one? From Matthew and uh, Llewellyn, um, asking or talking about the uh, the mapping or the, not mapping, but the spot recognition patterns. Um, so I think Sean was it who, who um, asked about uh, someone who is working on Kind of an automated system for identifying penguins based on their spot patterns that was yes richard jolie um and at the time that they were doing it they the difficulties were too much to overcome but possibly now with advances in machine learning and um, that could be revisited again uh, because obviously the penguins don't always present themselves nice and straight to the camera they're twisted or you know uh not showing the full front view uh, and all the spots so there were there were issues around that so it wasn't um, pursued further um but yeah uh it is something that we can possibly pursue so thank you very much matthew Gunnenberg, for for offering um to to get in touch i will put my email address in the chat box uh just now and then if you can get in touch with me that would be great um, and same, uh, Llewellyn, um, suggesting creating an app or, you know, something that can identify penguins in real time. So yeah, those are all great points and, and definitely something we will look into. Um, another question for Alistair, uh, from Lynette Redman, um, asking about the shipping noise is affecting the penguins at Bird Island. It's actually at St. Croix. Um, but Alistair, maybe you can give us a bit of background in that and what is being done about it. Uh, thanks, Christina. And thanks, Lynette. Yeah, that's also a really important question. So there was a, a paper that we published last year um, headed by Laurie and Pitcher Group from Nelson Mandela University, where we looked at the impact of um, increased shipping traffic associated with the bunkering activities, which is basically uh, fuel transfers at sea, um, which only started in 2016. And there's been a dramatic decline of penguins by more than 80% at St. Croix Island because of, and we suspect one of the main reasons um, is associated with that increase in vessel traffic, which is uh, marine noise pollution. It could be other factors, but there's definitely a strong correlation with that activity and a uh, sharp decline in penguins, unfortunately, from St. Croix Island. We, we also concerned around Bird Island, and that's something we can use um, the Weybridge that um, Eleanor mentioned to measure, because the, the, the vessel traffic offshore of Bird Island would have also increased in the shipping lanes heading towards um, or out of those anchorage areas where, where the bunkering is taking place. So that is a big concern. It's something we have um, been talking to Transnet about implementing different mitigation measures to reduce speeds of vessels, potentially looking at changing shipping lane directions into those anchorage areas um, and other mitigation measures that are known like internationally to reduce noise pollution. 
Um, so that's an ongoing um, project that we're looking at with various colleagues and collaborators in, in Algo Bay. Great, thanks, Alistair. Um, uh, now, last, the next question I wanted to ask, ask uh, from Martinez, uh, asking how long do penguins live for? Eleanor, do you want to uh, tackle that one? If you <laughs> You're catching me out of my basic biology here. <laughs> I'm actually not sure. <laughs> it's they quite long lived. I know mm. we've had a macaroni even on Marion that was 22 years old and still alive. But yeah, Christina, you definitely know more about African penguins. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think in captivity, the, the oldest that I've heard of is about 27 years. Um, in the wild, we would expect them to live uh, um, not as not live as long, um, and especially now, unfortunately, with the, the decrease in population, they're probably not living that long. But I think ten years, uh, yeah, ten to fifteen years is probably sort of average. Um, then, sorry, I'm just uh, looking for the next one. A quick one uh, asked by Dieter, asking about to her whether that's open to the public. Uh, the, the nature reserve itself is, um, but the, the penguin colony is not. Um, it's in an area that isn't accessible to the public. It's on the very eastern edge of the reserve. Um, so it's, yeah, it's not in an area that's, that's open to the public, unfortunately. And, and we are trying to limit disturbance so that, you know, especially in this very sensitive time while the penguins are establishing. But the, the rest of the Duhurp nature is beautiful and well worth visit. Um, then, uh, sorry, maybe, uh, Alistair, you can take this one from Terry about um, what the, the fish, the sardine and anchovy are used for. So he's, well, Sorry, Terry specifically asking what percentage of sardine uh, fish stocks are fished for animal feed. Thanks, Christina. Uh, yes, Terry, so we know out of the two uh, small pelagic fish that are fished most, anchovy and sardine, anchovy is mostly more than, yeah, almost 100% is used for fish meal and fish oil. Sardine is, um, I, I'm not sure of the percentage, but a large percentage is canned um, locally in South Africa. Um, some of it's also used for bait, uh, fresh for, for boxing, fresh or freezing bait. And there is a portion that goes into fish meal, but I'm not sure what it is. I do know because the sardine stocks are, are, are quite low that a lot of the sardine, I think more than 70% is actually imported to keep the canneries going. Uh, so I think a lot of that's imported from Morocco. Um, so certainly, yeah, the biggest value that comes out of sardine um, locally is actually the ones that are canned. Yeah, uh, when the stocks are, are are good. Yeah, and that's um, an important uh, source of protein for for a lot of people, um, a cheaper source of protein. But yeah, most of the anchovy, as Alistair said, goes to fish meal and fish oil. Uh, so Eleanor uh, William asks um, about how we asks both of us but I'll, I'll throw it to you how we started our careers and um, what we studied and what advice you would give to someone just starting university in, in terms of gaining still skills um, and William will be starting to volunteer at Sankob in June so thanks for that William. Uh, yeah that's very exciting um, definitely my biggest advice is take any opportunity that comes your way um, yeah, and yeah, just speak to as many people as you can and get advice from them. Um, Christine and I both hold master's degrees and Alistair has a PhD. Um, so yeah, definitely um, university is definitely helpful um, if you want to kickstart your career in science. Um, I mean, it's a huge field and there are so many different ways to get involved. Um, so I think, yeah, just take any opportunity that you can get and really find what yeah, makes you happy and <laughs> what you're really passionate about. Um, 
it can be conservation can be very a tricky field to work in because there is a lot of negative news so it is good to have that passion and keep that passion keep a new field every day <laughs> um but i mean as you can see now with christina's the web colony there are also a lot of positive stories coming out so yeah just take any opportunity you can get and work hard and yeah opportunities will come your way yeah absolutely that's a great great answer um <clears throat> yeah so I, I i don't think i can add anything to that yeah just take as many opportunities and volunteering as you uh, are doing is a, is a great way to kind of get your foot in the door um there's still quite a few questions to go but i am conscious of time and i know um my power will be going off shortly and eleanor's as well um, so let's try and get through a few more uh, before that happens. Um, there are some tricky ones, which I'm <laughs> trying to see who, who we give that to. Um, maybe, uh, sorry, we'll take Rosemary's one. Um, in the past, visiting Seaforth, uh, which is in Simonstown. Um, Rosemary noticed the public harassing penguins. Uh, is there a monitor there during the morning and evenings to stop this? Um, so they do have uh, penguin rangers that are um, sponsored through Sandcob that assist Sandparks and the city of Cape Town who kind of co-manage the, uh, the colony which is in boulders, which is the Sandparks area, but also fills out into uh, city of Cape Town then and they do have ranges there but I'm not sure uh, how often they're on duty and you know how long they or how early they arrive and how late they stay but um, it is it is an issue uh, people causing disturbance with with the penguins um, but I do know that they are doing their best to try and stop that I don't know Eleanor if you have seen anything in your uh, work at that colony? Um, yeah, it depends on the colony. I mean, certain colonies have permanent ranges. So like, for example, Bird Island, they have rangers stationed there um, for, I think, two weeks since or something. And they do do patrols at night to look for any poaching activity. Um, the land-based colonies, I'm not entirely sure if there is someone there overnight night but definitely during the day um and then of course you get these freak accidents um i think it was last year where some dogs got into the colony and killed penguins um and yeah people are definitely aware of that and are doing their best to stop any activity like that yeah absolutely uh so there's a question from doug uh asking about uh, the pet penguins whether they join up with the Duhok ones and uh, so for those who might not know, we were investigating uh, another site in Thet uh, to try and look at setting up a, another colony. Um, unfortunately, the, the challenges at that site with putting in a, a good predator-proof fence um, are just too uh, kind of insurmountable based on what we've learned at Hook. So we, uh, at this time, aren't looking or I'm continuing to look into to collect as a site for a penguin colony, um, but they, the um, Nature's Valley Trust and the Tsuniqua Rehabilitation Center do still release rehabilitated penguins from there. Um, it's very difficult to say where those go after they've been released. If they're adults, they'll head straight back to their breeding colony. Um, if they're juveniles, hopefully they will come to the Duhok colony and uh, set up shop there. And then, uh, yeah, there's quite a few questions still. Um, uh, Terry, Terry uh, has given us a bit of an answer about the, the monitors at Seaforth, um, saying that there are monitors on Seaforth, but over a wider area, and there's a security company after hours. Um, and harassment of penguins by selfie hunters is a big problem. Absolutely. Um, people trying to take selfies with, with penguins and getting too close uh, is a problem. But penguins do have a fierce bite, so 
they can <laughs> defend themselves, as um, Eleanor well and Alistair well know. Um, then Thomas and Margie have a have a question about uh, seal culling and um, whether that the culling being stopped has created an, an abundance of seals and hence more predation. And um, that's a tricky one. Uh, the as far as I know, the seal population, although it has rebounded since culling was stopped, it's not actually increasing per se anymore. It's they're kind of expanding and spreading out along the coastline. But I, I could be could be wrong on that. I'm not up to date on all the seal abundance. Um, but I think seal predation was always a problem or was always happening. Um, but now that the penguin population is so low, it's become more of a, a problem for the birds. Um, so I think it's, you know, it's a natural uh, sort of predation event, but just the fact that there are so few penguins and uh, possibly the, the seals can also sometimes struggle to find food if there's low fish abundance and then they turn to the penguins as a, another source. But I'm not sure that if the seal culling being stopped has, um, you know, directly caused that problem. Um, then Eleanor, uh, Ted from Ulan asks about uh, transponder stations on Robin and Dassin Islands. So maybe you can talk a bit about the, the planned work that uh, we, we hope to do later this year or next year, whenever it's planned. <laughs> yes, so we have been talking to colleagues um, in the UK, so Richard Shirley and Jackie Glencross and um, Kataludinia at Sankov about getting an APMS set up on the West Coast. Um, those islands are trickier to set up a system than, say, for example, Bird Island or Stony Point, because you obviously want to get as many penguins going over your system as possible. Um, and Dassin and Robin, there is not as obvious a place to put it um, where the penguins kind of naturally funnel up into one area. Um, but sand cob is the next time they go to Dutton, they're going to look out for where we can put up a wave bridge there. Um, I'm not actually sure if there is already a, just a transponder reader there. Um, Robin Island, there is a transponder reader. Um, and yeah, we have, we have been having discussions about whether we can put up a wave bridge and have some ideas of where to put it. Um, of course, funding is always an issue, so <laughs> we are also looking into funds. The systems can, the cost can become quite high and costs can add up. So, yeah, it's definitely in the pipeline and we really hope to get one up on the West Coast very soon um, at at least one of the sites, if not both. Yeah, absolutely. So if anyone uh, has any uh, funding suggestions for us or for... <laughs> getting uh, more funding for these uh, way bridges, please let us know. Um, I did pop my email address in the chat a feed earlier, so you can get in touch with us if, uh, if you have any questions or suggestions. Um, so there are just a few more questions that I'll try and get through them all, uh, as my power still seems to be on. <laughs> uh, Alistair, uh, I don't, no, if you want to take this question, I can uh, also give a stab at it. But uh, Silvio asks about the fishing companies and whether they are aware of the research, um, sort of working with us to um, investigate the, the, the penguin population decrease, and the fisheries potential role in that. Uh, so I don't know if you want to take that one. Sure. Otherwise, I can Thanks, do it. Thanks, Christina. Uh, happy, happy to have a go at it. Thanks, Christina. Yeah, Sylvia. Um, the the fishing companies, well, the representative of a few of the larger fishing com companies in Sapia um, have agreed to be a part of the island closure experiment, which has been ongoing since two thousand and eight. So they are aware of the research that is coming out. And they have committed themselves to be a part of this international review that's currently taking place by 
um, some of the top um, seabird and fishery scientists in the world. So um, they are committed to finding out what the, the real uh, impacts are. And then we'll see from that review what management recommendations are made. So it's a bit early to tell, but hopefully by the middle of this year, we should have some, some results there. Um, Christina, I can have a go at the next um, couple, if, yeah, if sure. that will help. If you just um, so, that. yeah, uh, Pat was asking about the El Nino, La Nina uh, systems and the potential impacts on food. So I do know that those definitely have a profound influence on the anchovy stocks in the Humboldt of South America, where the system is, yeah, more, the proximity of those systems is close in the Pacific. Uh, whether that affects our systems here is a really good question. I've been combing my <laughs> literature references to see, but I haven't heard of anything recently, but um, our anchovy and sardine stocks are definitely limited in terms of their water temperature requirements. So if um, an El Nino event, which is uh, predicted for the next few years, um, starting in the next summer, I think, or later this year, um, if that was to affect water temperatures, then certainly, yeah, it would have effect on the distribution um, and biology of these fish because, yeah, they are very temperature restricted to more cooler waters generally. Um, I haven't seen any studies directly linking El Ninos to uh, Benguela fish stocks, but I could be wrong. There could be something out there um, more recent. And then that, yeah, your follow-up question on how that would affect breeding success. So there's there are numerous studies published out there that link breeding success with prey supplies. Um, so that would link into uh, the last question as well. Um, there are a couple of studies that show, especially um, sardine stocks in the years preceding a breeding attempt has an impact on the breeding success of birds because Birds need to be in good condition before they start breeding. Um, so if their stocks, if the sardine stocks are low, especially on the West Coast, uh, before they attempt to breed, that definitely has quite a profound impact on their breeding success and survival as well. So um, as Christina showed earlier in the slides, um, there's quite a close correlation between the African penguin population and these fish stocks. It's just where it's fished, how much it's fished, um, is something that's more complicated, but in terms of the actual prey availability, there's definitely a close correlation. So it's trying to tease out the human versus natural processes that becomes the tricky thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Sorry, my, my power's just gone off, so I'm just uh, gonna uh, see what's happening. Um, uh, Cause my second screen has gone. Um, yeah, so I think we're almost done with the questions. Um, Michael Potts asks uh, whether the fish resources are still plentiful around Duhuk. And yes, that is the case. Uh, there are, as far as we're aware, there, there are still uh, plentiful fish stocks around Duhuk. That is one of the reasons that we uh, decided to put the, or try and reestablish that colony um, because we had various uh, kind of ways of, of telling, uh, you know, that there were good fish stocks around. Uh, the first is that the, the annual uh, fish surveys that the Department of Forestry, Fisheries and Environment does showed that there were, uh, there was good abundance of sardine and anchovy in that area. And then the other kind of line of evidence that we had was tracking that we did on birds that had finished breeding to uh, on the west coast and they had swum all the way around from Dyson Island to uh, the De Hoop area and were foraging in that. so we knew that there were fish in in that region and that was obviously very important uh, consideration in choosing the, the colony site. And now we just have one final question from Ruthie um, asking whether there's any way to restock the, the low fish stocks. And I'm not sure, um, Alistair or, or Eleanor, if either of you want to um, try and take that. I, I personally don't know what the answer is. Um, 
I think probably probably not. Uh, I don't know if Alistair or Eleanor want to chime in on that. Yeah, happy to have a go. Um, yeah, it's an interesting question, but yeah, the, the I suppose the problem with the small pelagic fish is that they quite low down um, in terms of uh, their position, their trophic position. So they feed on plankton mostly. So they're very difficult fish to um, stock in captivity. And they're very reliant on whatever influences upwelling and the supply of plankton. So as far as I know, no, there has been fin fish farming um, in the wild, but those are predatory fish. There's a lot of stuff on, you know, um, on aquaculture, even in the oceans with fin fish, but not with small pelagic fish, as far as I know. The best we can do to keep the stocks up is to manage them properly um, and yeah, lower the exploitation rates of them and especially allow them to recover when the populations are really low. So we don't want to repeat of what happened in Namibia where that stock was overfished um, in the 70s, 60s, 70s, early 80s, I think, and it was allowed to crash and it still hasn't recovered. So we've got to prevent that from happening. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think that's that's a good answer. Um, management of the stocks is is the key thing and one of the best things that we can do to try and um, not only ensure food for the penguins, but for all the other uh, seabirds and mammals and fish and sharks uh, and the commercial fishery that, that rely on these fish. Um, so I think that uh, with that, we will end off our webinar. We've gone through all the questions. Thanks very much to everyone who asked and for everyone for sticking around uh, with us for this. And uh, I've seen lots of comments coming through in the chat box and I will go through. Thank you very much for all those messages. Uh, of support and appreciation. Eleanor or Alistair, do you have uh, any last words you want to say before we sign off? Uh, no, just thank you to everyone who joined us tonight. And yeah, it was great to present on some of our work. So thank you very much, everyone. Uh, I just want to say you're well done, Christina and Eleanor, for a fantastic presentation. And thanks to everyone for joining. Yeah, I echo that thanks. Thank you very much for supporting our Conservation Conversations webinars. And please do join us again in uh, two weeks time for the next webinar, which will be on uh, the Southern Ground Hornbill with uh, Dr. Lucy Kemp. And it should be a very interesting webinar. So please do join us then. But from me, that's everything. So thank you very much for joining us and good night.